Young Justice Forum of the Year. Um, this year, we will be focusing on the Bring It Home Bill. So tonight, you are in store for a breakdown of the bill, as well as conversation about the nature of this bill, why it's needed, and the hopes of what it can do for families and communities in Minnesota. Um, before I get started, I want to um, go through a few housekeeping guidelines. So for starters, there's a closed captions are available through Zoom using the button labeled CC at the bottom of your screen. Please turn your video on if you are comfortable and able to. Please remain muted throughout the entire event. And lastly, we will be highlighting our guest speakers. So the best view for today's event is the speaker option. Before jumping in, I also want to read a land and labor acknowledgement. At Urban Homeworks, we acknowledge that we live our lives and do our work on land that European colonizers stole from the Dakota peoples indigenous to Minnesota. For this theft to occur, sadistic acts of genocide, rape, and forced assimilation were employed. We also acknowledge that we live our lives and do our work on land that was cultivated and developed by bodies that European colonizers stole from West African countries through the transatlantic slave trade. In order for this theft to occur, sadistic acts of genocide, rape, and forced assimilation were employed. We acknowledge what was taken from our collective human ancestors. As we do so, we commit to work and fight for the liberation of the descendants of those enslaved through American chattel slavery and the sovereignty of all native peoples. Thank you. So welcome everyone. My name is Tammy Ogunride and I am the Equity and Engagement Director here at Urban Homeworks. For those who do not know us, welcome, welcome. And I'd love to introduce our organization. Urban Homeworks is a nonprofit based in North Minneapolis, focused on housing justice. We have affordable housing throughout North and South Minneapolis, as well as St. Paul. Not only do we focus on providing dignified, stable housing through our rental properties, we also provide home ownership pathways opportunities. Part of our work though, and why we're here today, is to advance equitable policy that supports our communities and partner and empower the masses to engage civically. So today specifically, we wanna talk about the Bring It Home Bill. We have a very special opportunity given that we have over a $17 billion surplus and a trifecta in state legislation. This time, the time is now and we want to empower not only our elected officials, but our larger community to make noise and make progress to get the funding we need to properly support housing. Now we know there are other important causes advocating for this surplus as well, but we really want to stress the importance of passing legislation such as Bring It Home that focuses on housing. We at Urban Homeworks not only believe that housing is a human right, but we also believe it is foundational to the emotional, physical, academic, and social well being of Minnesota individuals, families, and communities at large. So, before we get into all of the conversations centered around the Bring It Home bill, um, we wanted to break down actually what is the bill so we can have shared understanding when we go into the conversation. So, we prepared a little presentation for you all just to discuss what Bring It Home is, talk about housing vouchers, as well as some of the myths centered around um, the bill. So wanting to speak into what is Bring It Home Minnesota and what it will do for Minnesota families and individuals. So in the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, what the bill can do. And it will be expanding the voucher system that currently is in place at a federal level. So the Bring It Home bill, most intentionally known as House File 11 in the House of Representatives and Senate File 11 in the Senate, will build off of uh, federal funding to provide state vouchers to families and individuals at the 50% AMI level. Um, again, we believe that this is really important in order to properly support 
again, our frontline workers, our small business owners, our families who are working and just need the support. And we believe a lot of the elected officials saw the need and that's why they put forth housing file 11 and Senate file 11. We have over 35 authors of this bill, um, Senator How or Representative Howard, Agbaje and Perez Vega being three of those authors. So for those who don't know, what is in fact a rental voucher? So a voucher again provides um, funding to families and individuals at a certain AMI level that can help increase stability. So if they were to live in um, a rental unit that they're spending more than 30% of their income towards, this, this rental voucher would essentially help pay the difference so they're able to stay in their homes of choice. Now, if that rent were to go up, again, families don't have to worry about being displaced because the subsidy would help to cover that difference. I wanna break it down a little bit more with the specific example that we have on the next slide. So we have our example of Aviva, who is a mom with three kids. And Aviva makes about $3,500 monthly. And her rent is currently $1,659 a month. So right now she's paying 47% of her income towards rent, meaning Aviva is cost burdened and rent is unaffordable for her. With the housing voucher, she would be able to have $609 of that cost covered. This would save Aviva over $7,000 annually, which would allow her to do things such as cover medical expenses or other basic needs. And in the long term, being able to do things like build a emergency savings, um, save for a down payment, as well as maybe save for her college tuition fund. So we really see the tangible impact that this could have on not only an example as Aviva, but real families and individuals who need this support. Now there's a lot of conversation about this bill and a lot of it can be um, misinformation. So we wanna take some time to break down some of the myths that are centered around this bill. So the first myth is that federal, our federal program is enough. And that honestly is not true. Currently with federal dollars, only one in four Minnesotans are getting the support they need. And we'll hear a little bit more about that from a testimony of our other, of one of our resident speakers. And of the one in four Minnesotans who get the housing voucher, they were waiting for two or more years to get the support. The reality is the need is now so the funding needed has to be here to be able to support families so they aren't being displaced. And two to five years waiting for federal funding is hurting families, creating displacement. The next myth that I want to talk about is um, this idea that we don't have the budget for it. Currently, we spend about 1% of our state budget towards housing. And to um, increase that to the need for the bring it home bill, but only increase it to 4%. So we're only asking still for a small sliver of that pie to properly support our Minnesota families and this need. The final myth that I wanna talk about is that racial inequity isn't being addressed. And although the bill specifically doesn't name BIPOC families or individuals, because we know that a lot of families at that target AMI, that 50% AMI level are our BIPOC families, we're, we're targeting, we're, we're focusing on equity here by targeting those families, giving a lot of our BIPOC families opportunities to, again, have stable housing, have more money in their pocket for their daily needs, their um, savings, funding down payments, things such as that. So although it's not specifically named, we still see how this bill will indirectly impact our BIPOC families. Now, um, this, uh, this document will be sent out after the, um, 
after today's event, but we wanted to just uh, quickly touch on some of the sources that we use to guide our understanding of this bill to educate everyone. Now, I know this is just a high level um, understanding of the bill. Um, we weren't going into a deep dive and we suggest that you go to um, the legislative page to dive deeper into the bill itself or go to Bring It Home's website to learn more about the bill. Um, but we wanted to just give you a um, higher level understanding so you understand some of the things we're talking about as we go into the conversation that is about to happen. I am really excited to pass it off to our executive director, Asali Sol Young, who will be leading an amazing conversation between some of our residents and elected officials on the Bring It Home bill. Thanks so much, Tammy. Uh, really grateful for that breakdown. I know that there are folks on this call who really appreciated that uh, opportunity to get just some basics on what this bill is about. I'd love to welcome you all again. My name is Asale Sol Young. I'm the executive director here at Urban Homeworks and really excited to engage with residents, current renters and electeds uh, in a conversation around what this thing will look like on the ground and the impact that it can have. And so with that, I'd love to just have our guests go ahead and introduce yourselves. Uh, and I know that they are going to be spotlit here. So um, love to go ahead and start with our renters that are joining us on the call. Uh, Latanya, will you start by introducing yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Latanya. I am a mother with three boys. Um, I've been in Minnesota. I've been back to Minnesota going on, I wanna say like four years now. Um, awesome, thank you, Latanya. Corey. Hi, my name is Corey. Um, I've been in Minnesota for uh, 35 years. Um, I have a son that attends Minneapolis North High School. And I'm just happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time being with us, Corey. All right. We are joined by three legislators. Thank you so much for being with us. If you all could just pop around and introduce yourselves, let us know what districts you represent as well. That would be great. Hi, everybody. So grateful to be here uh, tonight. I, my name is Mike Howard. Uh, I'm the chair of our housing committee, and I represent Richfield and a little slice of Minneapolis in the Minnesota House. I'll, I'll pass it to Esther. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Esther Agbaje. I am the vice chair of our housing committee, and I represent a district that covers parts of downtown Minneapolis, parts of St. Anthony, Maine, and a big chunk of North Minneapolis. Good evening, my name is Representative Maria Perez Vega. I represent District 65B, which is St. Paul's downtown, West 7th, the west side of St. Paul and the city of West St. Paul. Beautiful, thank you all so much for being here. We know you're busy, you're right in the middle of a lot of voting uh, on this 17 plus, I think it's nearly $18 billion surplus. So we really appreciate your time today. Uh, I'd love to really actually start with residents. Um, it's really important to us that you all have the opportunity to speak to electeds directly. Um, and I know that not all of our electeds can stay with us the whole time. So I wanna make sure that everybody gets to hear your voices. Latanya, can you share with us the experiences that you have had um, on current wait lists for vouchers. And I, I also understand that you were, had to move in order to secure stable housing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, in 2010, 2010, I had um, put that application here in Minnesota to sign up for Section 8 and um, got put on a waiting list. Um, I'm still on a waiting list now. I had to move to Green Bay, Wisconsin in 2011 because the waiting list, I was still on the waiting list. They were saying it was going to take up to, I believe, 10 years. So I moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin, took my boys there, and we got Section 8 within a year, and I was able to move back here. Wow, and you said that you're still on that waiting list I'm, here. I'm actually still, as of to today, I'm still on the waiting list here in Minnesota for Section 8. So that's 12 years 
Is that right? Did I do that yeah. math right? 12 years? Yeah, 12 years. 12 years on our waiting list. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think it really helps to give folks context for why this added funding is needed for a voucher program. So really grateful for that. Corey, I'm gonna give you the next question. Um, I'd love to hear from you on what the limitation of, of the current system, what it prevents you from being able to accomplish and work on with your family. Because I know you have a family uh, I know you have young people that are getting looking out to college. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, the added piece of of what you're unable to do as you put well, so much income towards rent. Thank you. Yeah, for me, for me, with the uh, with the rent and how high it is right now, and uh, and the cost of living and uh, and what I make uh, hourly, it's very difficult for me to you know even save money for my son's tuition. It's, it's hard for me to save money even to buy me a new car even save to even try to be a homeowner. Now with this bill right here, 30%, it allowed me to have extra money, maybe even go to vacation with my family. I haven't been in a while. Um, save money, like I said, for my son's college tuition. And also, man, you know, um, to uh, put a down payment down on the house. And even just, like I said, just take my uh, my wife and my son on a vacation. It's been uh, difficult to do the last past like seven, eight years because the uh, cost of living uh, is not balanced out with uh, my hourly pay is. So I'm actually just living to, uh, from check to check. And at this point, that 30%, uh, it will definitely help me and my family out uh, uh, 110%, it really would. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that as well. Um, and for folks that maybe don't understand that context, we consider folks um, making I'm sorry, folks spending more than 30% of their income on housing as cost burdened because of those limiting factors that Corey just spoke to, the inability to um, secure savings for your family, the inability to support your young people in going to school, the inability to consider home ownership, uh, which is why this is so important. I'm gonna turn it uh, to you officials that have joined us for a moment. I'd love to hear from your perspective um, why this bill is important. I can go first. Um, and I think some of the presentation um, from Tammy really highlighted how important it is because, I mean, nothing in our lives go well unless you have access to a stable home. And for an increasing number of, of people in, in our state, um, the rent continues to escalate um, nowhere near what wages do. Uh, and the extreme supply demand shortage means that uh, there's more than 200,000 people that are paying more than 50% of their income in, in rent. And when you're paying that much in rent, you're uh, one bad break, you know, uh, one missed work shift or a family member sick that you have to care for um, away from a housing crisis. And so in some ways, what I, I really appreciate and like about this proposal is its simplicity in that we're saying uh, we think there is value in creating a system where Minnesotans have access to an affordable, stable home. And if we do that, um, we think there's so many ripple benefits that will come with it. Um, and uh, it, to me, this specific bill, um, no single bill, we need to do a lot of different things, but no single bill would do more to reduce homelessness, to create housing stability than this one. That's great. Thank you so much, Representative Howard. Representative Perez Vega, I'm gonna turn it to you next. Can you speak to the impact that you see this having on your constituent base? Completely. I mean, 80% of my district are renters. Um, I, we have a diverse community that doesn't come from the privilege of generational wealth, which is a key factor into housing and who has, you know, uh, a roof over their head. Um, and uh, speaking in a town hall that I recently just had uh, with a lot of our rent stabilization movement here in, in St. Paul that were part of the HENS movement, this means uh, a step of security, um, a, a, a step of safety, uh, a step of a healthy mental capacity for my, my constituents in my district that are constantly 
uh, calling our offices, whether it's a state to a city, um, a, a city office in need of, of support. It's uh, hardworking people. Um, I'm a single mom. I'm a renter. You know, I am fortunate that, you know, I have a home over my head and I understand these policies and how they work because I've been at the forefront of whether you're going to pay for your health care or pay for the roof uh, over your head or pay to provide for your child. So this is this hits home. This is home for many of our family members and many of uh, uh, of our our immigrant communities that um, are, are 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 thriving, you know, in their work and their field, but are are shackled down from uh, a housing crisis. So this right here is, you know, I think Corey stated it. You know, it gives you an opportunity to 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 focus on on your family, to focus on self care, to focus on what's going to keep you healthy. Because uh, it, it's not a matter of who's working hard or who's not. You know, everyone's working hard. They shouldn't have to focus on giving everything that they've been putting in to, to sacrifice and not being able to enjoy uh, the moments with families or for their child's future. So this is an opportunity that's never been seen before at this level in the state. Um, and I'm just really grateful for uh, Chair Howard and uh, Vice Co-Chair Bajay because you know, it's, it's, it's showing you the conversations of equity and fighting for equity and policy. And that's what we see here. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Representative. Thank you so much for just sharing a personal anecdote alongside of um, this, the stories of your constituents. Um, really appreciate that. And I do know that you have to leave soon. So I want to give you just a chance in general to say, what is something for folks that don't understand this? folks that maybe are leaning in the other direction, what is just something that you wanna make sure they understand before they leave this room today? Understand that everyone has a different, uh, a different you know, form of, of upbringing, comes from different places, different platforms, different stages, you know, but this is an opportunity of balance. This is an opportunity for folks to create more opportunities and conversations and um, housing's been segregated. <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's been completely segregated. And if folks, we can talk hours and hours of all the, the documentaries and the, and the literature that's out there um, and, and advising folks to sources and facts and data that, uh, you know, Representative Esther and Mike do so well every day in, in, this, in this battle. And, and I think it's just more of a day by day you can agree to disagree with some folks, but we have to push for the reality that folks are homeless or folks, you know, can't afford to live in their homes. And the reality is, is that we need to make it better. And these are the laws that we need to pass that are going to adjust that and that are going to create balance. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate um, both uh, Representative Howard and Representative Perez Vega speaking to the reality that this isn't about folks being lazy. It's about folks not having access to resources that support them um, and being their full selves. So I really, so thank you both for that. Representative Akbaje, I know you and I talk about housing and so I know that this is near and dear to your heart. Would love you to speak to help, help frame up for us like the impact of housing and housing stability for folks as well as what you're seeing in North Minneapolis and how this can potentially start to counter some of the uh, corporate investment that is coming into the community and pulling resources away. Definitely, yeah. I mean, you know, I think my colleague said it really great and as well as our, our renters as well, housing is fundamental. And so, you know, without that, you can't really do anything else. But one of the things that we're noticing is that in this, in this pathway to getting home ownership, there are now new ways that are preventing black and brown families from becoming homeowners. And one of that is this, you know, growing trend of corporations buying out single family homes, particularly in black and brown communities. So, you know, it's, it's a discussion that we're having here at the Capitol. Um, you know, I had a bill on it and my author in the Senate, Senator Bolden had a, had a hearing on it as well. And, you know, we were airing out those issues about the fact that now we don't really have redlining anymore. We don't have those covenants, but there are other buyers who can come in with cash 
can waive a variety of contingencies and they can pick up a number of homes in our neighborhoods and use them solely to just rent back out to people. And that could be good if they were present landlords and they were paying attention to people's needs, but they're not present. They're usually these companies that are based out of New York or California or Washington state, or they may even be international. And so what we're talking about at the Capitol now is how do we kind of rein in a lot of those corporate investors in the housing market? So that way homes are really for people. Homes are really for families. Homes are really for those who want to live in those in those houses and live in those communities. Because what I hear from my constituents is that we need more people who are homeowners, particularly across North Minneapolis, who have a stake in the community, who want to see the community thrive and who aren't just there to try to make a profit. And so those are the types of conversations we're having. We're looking at greater ways to increase down payment assistance so that way, you know, individual family buyers are more competitive in the marketplace um, and really just making sure that people have that opportunity to the American dream if that's what they want. Thank you for that, Representative Akbaje. It's really important to just hear about the different efforts supporting, working to support all of us um, in our fight for stability and, and the fight for, for wealth building and to close that economic gap. Um, I'm going to move now to hear testimony from someone who was unable to be with us today. And so, oh, I'm sorry, he, what, he is able to be with us today. I, was, I stand corrected by my team. Thanks for that. Um, Steve Hardy, thank you so much for being here. I know that Stephen wrote a testimony um, that wasn't able to be heard on the floor. And so we're really excited that we get a chance to hear from you today, Stephen. Um, Please introduce yourself. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here to hear everyone today. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Okay. I'm from I'm from, I'm from Chicago, Illinois, and today I had and today as a resident of Aon, I've been asked to speak about the importance of passing bringing it home. Minnesota this year. I was born in Chicago and when I was a young man I was addicted on drugs. Since I've grown up my parents didn't want me around around the house and I was on my own. I had a job working at a car wash. I was a flow manager but I you know my addiction I stole money to support my habit. I had gotten myself into a rut and then I continued for a reasonable amount of time. But I knew that wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't me. So in 2012, I decided to make a change in my life. I called a friend up and he stayed in the St. Paul. I didn't know what St. Paul was. I mean, I was, you know, I didn't, you know. But I got on the bus to Minnesota. And when I got here, I felt like a new man. I didn't know that. I didn't know that was just the beginning. I stayed with a friend who stayed in St. Paul for a couple of months, but I was still feeling homeless. I was still in the same position, but I wasn't on drugs. And that was a good thing. After a while, I found out a place called the House of Charity, which is downtown Minneapolis. And I went down there for an interview and I ended up having my own my own room there. And I connected with a lot of people, a lot of resources here in the city of Minneapolis, which gave me you know, money each month and helped me be stable. I was in House of Charity for about three months. And in that process, I got on the GIH program and they gave me my apartment, my first apartment. I decided to take advantage of the opportunities and went outside every day, walked around, stayed clean. And eventually I was able to have my own place where I can pay my own rent. Having the extra support, me in a lot of ways, it helped me with my stability, being off drugs, and it helped me find other things to do. I, like, I actually like playing video games. And I, <laughs> and I can say that's my sobriety. 
playing video games was a, a little like, you know, keep me in the house every day, keeps me inside off the streets and keeps me planted, keeps me stable. And of course, my fiance, Mary, who's in the bedroom right now, she just came in. She helped me too. And by her being here, she's my guardian angel. She's been by my side ever since. We have one child together, a daughter, her name's Misha, and she's now 40 years old. And she's grown and has her own place. I'm so proud of her. Once I got sober, you know, Mary, like, like I said, she came up here in 2015 and we we're, we're a good team. We both like to help and we both like, when we both have big hearts. So we help with our community and now with the food shelf and residents, you know, have events around the apartment and we do have a food shelf to help the residents in the building. Being where I am now, I would love to, you know, for others, pe persons to feel the same way I'm feeling. For them to have the basic support with their rent, to give them a chance for them to grow, for them to have other opportunities like taking the kids to basketball games and going out for dinner instead of worrying about rent. That's why I think it's important for us to pass, bring it home Minnesota for all the people who just need a little bit of support that they can rely on. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was such a gift you just gave us. I really appreciate your willingness to be so vulnerable um, with the crowd of folks that you don't necessarily know. Um, yes, it's uh, to the cause. Yes, I mean, I wear this shirt. I wear it with pride ever since I left the Capitol. I, I spoke to a lot of, I spoke to Keith Ellison. I spoke to some senators, you know, it was, it was really emotional like I am now to, uh, to sit here and talk to you guys about this. And yes, I would love to, you know, just see, just see people with the, have a lot of support. That's you know, right. That's and get right. out of the room and don't worry about rent. Don't, you know, just like, you know, like Corey said, you know, take my family to vacations, take my, you know, help my kids out, you know, for tuition and everything like that. So, Yes, I'm 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 hundred percent in. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephen. We are all just rooting for you and your family. And, um, really want the best for you all. Thank you. So yes, thank you. All right. Uh, we're gonna open the floor to a conversation. We're gonna um, pull up everybody and really have a chance for our all of our guests to really talk to each other. This is a great opportunity for current renters to ask our um, officials about details that you're wondering about, one, making sure that they are thinking about all the different angles that impact your lives. Uh, I will kick off the first question and then I'm gonna turn it over to you all. So um, Representative Abbaje and Representative Howard, one of the questions that we've received about this bill is whether or not the bill allows for people who have a criminal record to receive a voucher. And I'll just open it to either of you to speak to that. Uh, it's a good question. The short answer is uh, folks would be able to receive a voucher. There's nothing in the bill that would uh, be exclusive in that way. We've seen, and I think that's important because of how much we've seen um, folks be shut out of the, the ability to have uh, housing, uh, wh whether it be through rental screening practices or what have you, um, we should be doing more to make uh, make assistance accessible. Um, and so that, that that would be provided for in the, in the bill. Awesome. Anything that you want to add, Representative Akbaji? No, I mean, I think that that's great. I mean, people need housing, especially if they're coming back from prison, that's the best way to get reintegrated. So if this will apply to them as well. Beautiful. All right, no pressure, Corey and Latanya. Okay. Well, and we have well, a whole room 
And Stephen, yeah. we have a full room of, of residents as well. So I'm going to mute myself so I'm not tempted to ask a question. And let Once you all again, my over. name is Corey. Um, I have a question. Um, how would you ensure true truth, making sure landlords don't turn uh, certain vouchers away? Yeah, we just I'm actually we just talked about that in committee today. Um, <laughs> so this would if if the law that we're working on getting passed goes through, then this would qualify as public assistance because it would be state funded public assistance, and so landlords would not be able to to discriminate against someone solely because they're receiving assistance. Now, if there's other criteria they have, then you don't meet that. That's a different conversation. But they can't just see that you have that you're using public assistance. And then that's the reason for denying you. So we're hoping that that goes through. It, we know some other cities around the state already have that for current pub public assistance programs. And so we want to be able to emulate that. So that way people across the state, especially if House File 11 goes through and then the House File that we talked about today goes through, then no one, no landlord should discriminate against you because you're using a voucher. Fair enough. So, uh, so in regards to that, um, if I was... Uh... If I wanted to move um, to a different city as far as like up north Minnesota, the voucher would also come with me as well. I believe it is a mobile voucher. Is that right, Representative Howard? Yes, it, it, it's the bill would kind of create m mobile vouchers. There's also a, a, an ability to create place based vouchers as well. Um, and what that means is we we're, we are hoping to actually not only uh, provide vouchers for folks, but incent the creation of more housing. And so one thing we've heard from uh, nonprofit housing developers is that it, it's challenging to get the financing to, to build housing that's truly affordable. And so that's one of the kind of ripple benefits of doing this. We think it'll not only help people have a voucher, but will help developers actually create more housing that's accessible. I have a question. Um, now, how now you got you say that it's like it's thirty percent of your income, right? What if my pay rate go up a couple of extra dollars? Would my rent go up extra hundreds? That's a really good question. We have a mechanism in the bill, so it, it, it well, it would depend on sort of right now you uh anybody who qualifies for a section eight voucher would qualify for this bill and so under that bill it's at um you know it's what's called 50 percent of area media income and we wanted to create a mechanism so let's say you get a little raise and that puts you just outside of that we don't want people to get a raise that and then all of a sudden they lose that whole housing voucher and so there's uh a mechanism where you, you folks would be able to to maintain that or it would scale back so that it isn't sort of this all or nothing thing where if you get just outside of the income level you use this important important housing stability voucher D does that kind of answer your question yeah you know the piggyback on what she was saying um um what about uh if your kids uh obtain uh, employment, um, would, would that also go uh, as far as uh, uh, your, your, your annual, uh, your uh, monthly uh, income? It's a good question. If it's your uh, kids, I don't, I do not think it would. Um, if, if it's, it's household income, if it's a spouse, I believe it would factor into overall household income. Right. The reason I said it is because next year my son will be 16 and uh, he's going to obtain him some employment. And so I was just wondering, like, would that uh, would they include his his income with uh, me and my wife? So, so. It's a good question. I don't think so, but I'm going to confirm to make sure. I, I appreciate the question. Fair enough. So, Tanya or Stephen, do you have any other questions? So, um, for like how long, if someone try to apply, how long would the list be, or how long would it take for them to get the voucher? Another really good question. Um, 
in to our vision in the long term would be that we would provide enough vouchers. So there's no such thing as waiting lists. That okay. if you qualify for a housing voucher, um, you would receive one. As we implement this, it it, it will take some time um, to for the public housing authorities that are going to be sort of helping match folks up with their housing. So I don't know if we have an exact definitive time. Um, the other piece that is important with this is we need to be building more housing. Um, if we're gonna be able to uh, create access for everyone that qualifies um, for a voucher, we need to create more housing to make sure, because it, it's one thing to have a voucher, it's another thing to find a place where you wanna live and the community you wanna live. Um, and so that's the other piece of this in the longer term that we need to be working on as well, because as, as we all know, there there just is not enough housing in our communities available right now. Um, one other question, um, Representative, do you guys think that um, with this bill getting passed, uh, it would uh, uh, lower the crime rate in uh, in our communities? I don't know if there'll, there'll be a direct one to one correlation, but what we do know is that communities that have more stable housing. Families are more stable. People know where they're going at the end of every day. And to also then bring in more amenities. You have people who are more engaged in the community. And so that could lead to potential decreases in crime. Um, we're hoping that as we're providing that fundamental resource for people, that maybe it'll make them less likely to make difficult choices. Fair enough. I think there's a lot of benefits that are sort of that. It, it's a good question in that sometimes when we presented the bill, folks look at the the number, you know, that this would cost uh, $2 billion a year um, to implement. And, you know, for some folks, wow, that's a big number. But I don't think we need to consider the all the savings or the benefits um, for our communities alongside of what that kind of investment would bring. Um, and so thinking about just sort of community wellness, safety, I think is one piece I think a lot about um, the achievement gap in our schools. Uh, you know, we, we know that one of the biggest indicators to education performance uh, can be if uh, if students have don't have housing stability. How can we expect our students, our kids, to be prepared to learn if they don't, you know, know where they're going to sleep at night? And so, um, and and there are many others. I, and I think so. It's a good question and a good. Thing for us to be considering about what are the multitude of benefits that happen when people are stable and can afford their homes. Now, when the, now, now when this bill gets passed, you know it's going to get passed. When it gets passed, um, how will we be able to? Uh, where will we go to, uh, for applications out there? First, I appreciate the. I, I like the the confidence when this bill passes. I, I, I <laughs> we, we we've still got work to do, but but I can tell you, Vice Chair Baje and I are are very committed. We're we're pushing. Um, we're we're actually still working on some of those timeline pieces, um, yeah. but kind of how our our budget process works is the the bills we pass this year are for kind of our next budget year, which begins in July of this year. Um, it's still going to take some time to kind of after we pass this to sort of get the ad administrative pieces moving, but I I think it's realistic to think by you know the beginning of next year if we were to pass it this year by the beginning of next year we could start to see um, the benefits start to take hold and folks able to access vouchers. That would be my hope. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, I got a question. Um... So when a bill get passed and we people apply and get the voucher, do we have to find places that you guys build or we can find our own landlords and you guys um, connect with them? How, how does that work? Another really good question. I think it can work both ways. It kind of, it, and it's meant to mimic a little bit like our current Section 8 system where you know, if you can, if you find a place you want to rent and apply to rent, um, 
that you can find that and work with the, the, the public housing authority who would then sort of handle the voucher piece of it. Um, the public housing authorities, they can often be helpful in sort of finding a place as well. So it's meant to work kind of both ways and be a two way street. I have one question. Go for it. If the, if the, if the bill passes, can I apply for a house? Instead to purchase a home, home or to rent? Yeah. Well, to rent a home. Rent, yeah, you would be able to apply and receive a voucher to rent. Um, I saw some questions in the chat about home ownership. There are separate programs for that. Um, and we're trying to, there's some that currently exist through Minnesota Housing, um, and people can apply to those programs. There's some community programs. Um, Build Wells Minnesota is, is one that's located in North Minneapolis, and they've been around for like 20 years. Um, and there's other community groups too, like the various community land trust groups. And so those are organizations that are helping people with down payment assistance and helping them get into home ownership. I know the Urban League also has some programs. Um, and some of these banks too are also starting to do some outreach to the community to help people get into home ownership. So we don't currently have a bill or like a government specific pro like a new one design uh, for home ownership outside of our down payment assistance bills that we're hoping that will pass. Yeah, the reason why I asked that question because I'm my rent is like like this. With my my with my social security and my rent is like this. And I think I get that much that's how much change I have left over. I mean I'm not complaining. I love my place. I love my one bedroom. But I want a house. You know, but it's like I say I'm blessed you know, but I'm right there. That's the reason why I asked. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So I'm actually going to do a quick, we have um, question, a couple of questions in the chat and there are some questions that didn't get covered. So I'm going to try to do a rapid fire. Uh, just focus on Rep. Akbaje and Representative Howard. Um, can you just break down for folks the difference between state level vouchers and federal level vouchers? So as um, Tammy's presentation mentioned, the federal, there's nothing that we're pursuing at the state level that would sort of change what the federal government provides in terms of section eight vouchers. And what this bill would do is sort of come in and say, if you qualify for those programs, we're going to use state dollars to provide a voucher to you um, to make sure you have housing stability. So in a way, it's providing that state funding so that if you qualify, you would receive a voucher. And functionally, how they would work for renters would be very similar. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure there'd be a ton of difference in terms of how they function or work for, for their, or, or someone who's utilizing it to rent. Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> Another question similar to that line of thinking um, is just around how folks enter the program. It's a really practical question. How do folks enter the program and are there thoughts around um, how this program will differ in that it will potentially have outreach to communities rather than communities have to be connected to others or be in the know? Can you guys speak to that? I'd love to hear from Rep Akbaje. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think there's probably still some discussions about how that implementation piece will work out. And so um, what would be really cool to see, which we haven't talked about this yet, <laughs> what would be really cool to see if it was possible, is like if this could be kind of connected when people apply for an apartment, or maybe it's connected to their taxes or something. I don't know, like then that way you would get that subsidy kind of like immediately if you, cause now like tax forms are asking if you're a renter or a homeowner. So if you check that you're a renter then maybe it checks your income against the qualification for the state program. But that's also very high tech. Government doesn't always work as efficiently as that. So I imagine for the definitely, you know, if and when this gets implemented, the first couple of years will start, still probably be an opt-in program. Okay, that's really helpful for folks. Um, and then the last question that I have, oh, somebody just popped in another one. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I like in tandem with this question in the chat about hurdles, 
we are understanding that the bill takes $2 billion to be fully funded, recognizing that we won't hit that number. We're not likely to hit that number in this legislative session. Um, what are you committed to doing to getting this fully funded? And then what support to the question in the chat is needed for us to support your work in getting this funded? That's kind of the $2 billion question, right? Or the million, well, however you want to say it. Um, so I, I think the, uh, I don't want to speak for, for Esther, but I think we're committed to seeing this through, knowing that we can't in one session probably get there. But what I think is the best path is to um, to fight for as much resource as we can to get this program started. And that I truly believe that if we're able to do that and sort of um, show its impact um, and to, to highlight some of the stories that we've, are, we've, we've heard from, from Stephen, from Corey, from Latanya, and folks that start to utilize this program, that's going to do more to fuel the momentum to go further and to provide, to, to get all the way to the finish line than anything else. And so this session, I feel like our hurdle is sometimes the biggest one to break through. Um, to, to do something that's different that hasn't been done before. Um, and then once we do that, I feel like there can be a collective effort to keep the momentum going and, and to show that there is benefit, there's value, and we should try to keep going so that every Minnesotan uh, has access to something like this that needs it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think a lot of it is really just getting getting a part of it through, right? Even if it's, even if it's envisioned smaller than what we originally have that's kind of how things work in, in government. You kind of start small and you grow and you get bigger. Um, and I think it's just really important for people to continue to like reach out to their legislators, write op-eds, talk to their community members about how, how important this is. And also just reminding folks of like, hey, maybe before you bought your home, like, do you remember how hard it was for you to struggle? Or, you know, I think I think people quickly forget the precarious situation that renters can find themselves in. And so I think just continuing to tell those stories, continuing to find people that it resonates with, continuing to, to, to speak with us. I mean, we're champions of it, so we're going to do what, we're, what we best can do up here. But if you are living in suburbs and you have representatives that, you know, they may not be thinking of this top of mind, it's helpful to reach out to them to just kind of tell your story. So. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, really important to call your legislators and let them know that this is important to you. You can also write emails and we're going to um, have a quick segment to get into, so we all do collective action together on this call. I wanna just close out our fishbowl with some dreaming, some visioning for a future where Bring It Home has passed to the full $2 billion. Uh, and I will call on folks and then we will close out this segment. Um, Corey, from your perspective, uh, what are the benefits or what does Bring It Home mean for the community? Can someone unmute Corey, please? It'll, it'll bring, it'll bring uh, some peacefulness, serenity, you know, um, you don't have to keep, you don't have to always worry about, you know, um, where your next dollars will come from because of this rent, this high rent we're paying. Um, I just think this bill getting passed, man, it's going to make life a lot easier for, man, 70% uh, of the people, man, that's living in Minnesota right now. That's, you know, that's unfortunate that we really don't have, um, the money to uh, to really afford to you know uh, pay rent and have a decent living as well. So um, I just think it'll bring the community a little bit closer together, especially when you don't have the stress of uh, you know living paycheck to paycheck and uh, you know just having a comfortable uh, living environment for you and your family. So um, I would think it'll bring a little a little a little a little less stress and a lot more peace, man, into uh, these homes. Awesome, thank you. All right, really quickly, Latanya, can you speak to uh, what you would do if only 30% of your income had to go toward housing? What else would you do with that, that money you work so hard for? Before I speak on that, um, I wanna know how would this help the all the children, especially children and people 
that need special help, like how my this bill gonna help them. I have little cousins that special me and they're moving to Minnesota um, this summer. So you say y'all gonna pass this bill, but it's gonna get passed for next year. I wanna know how it's gonna help my cousins, my special cousins. There is, I don't think there's anything specific in the bill that's related to um, families with, with children with special needs. But what I will say is that if, as I've talked with folks and heard stories, it it can be a lot to manage, um, you know, whether it's um, interactions with the school or with healthcare, et cetera, with children that have special needs while you're also trying to make ends meet and maybe work two jobs to be able to afford uh, your rent. Um, and so my hope would be that if we can sort of provide that housing stability, that base level of housing stability, that creates more time, more stability, more support for parents uh, with, with special need kids to, to spend time doing the kinds of things they want to if they weren't um, overburdened by the cost, the stress, um, all of the things that come with the str struggle if you can't afford your home. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, for me, um, I want to be able to pass with it. Help me, I'll be able to put some money to the side to go take some vacations with my kids because we haven't did that. We never took a trip together. And I love to take them somewhere to raise six flags or some. Um, and feel good about it and not have to work a full-time job and um, come home late and I don't know it, it helped me out a lot once y'all pass this bill. Awesome thank you Latanya and thank you for that question you snuck in there I appreciate that. <laughs> that was a, it's a great question so thank you. Um, Representative Akbaje what do you see as the benefits the, the multi-generational benefits to this bill? I think that this bill is going to provide a lot of stability for folks. And I think over time, you'll see that if you're not rent burdened and you're able to only just pay 30% of your income, um, you'll have funding to be able to do other things. So like, you know, Corey and Latanya talked about, you can spend more time with your kids, you can take vacations, you can you know, fix up your car, whatever, whatever it is, and then probably even start to save up some funding and, you know, maybe work with some organizations or banks and become a homeowner if that's what you want, and then start building your equity and wealth. So I see this as a great game changer to getting people from, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, we need to move people from renting to home ownership. I have a lot of thoughts on that, but if that's something people want to do, that's one way to do it. And I think keeping making sure people are stable and renting to be able to then move into home ownership is really important. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, Steven, I'm going to look to you to give us our last uh, word and then we're going to close out our fishbowl. Um, yeah. On that, on to, that. Yeah. Speak to just like what you um, see as a community benefit to bring out. I mean, you know, like you say, um, you know, just seeing a lot of uh, improvement in people's lives that, um, you know, they got stability, they got help, you know, to where they can get something towards a home or an apartment for themselves and a sufficient apartment to make them feel, you know, at home. They're not on the streets. But for me, if I was to get to 30, I mean, I would, I would take a vacation and take my wife to go see our daughter in, in Georgia, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, I would, I would just love to see just, you know, the bill passed and, you know, for, for people to start being happy now, you know, just to have people smile, go on vacations and have fun with their families. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Steven. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to um, one of our staff, our development director, Paul Bleem, is going to read testimony from two AN residents, uh, Derek and Sheila, that were unable to be with us today. We are Sheila Stafford and Derek Haracho, and we are writing to express our support for the Bring It Home 
Minnesota campaign. As individuals who have experienced the difficulties of finding affordable housing, we know the impact this bill could have on thousands of Minnesotans like us. I, Sheila, moved to Minneapolis under the impression that I would have a job with the, the company I was working with. Coming from another town in Minnesota, they told me I would have a position in another branch of the company if I moved. When I got here, though, that position fell through. I stayed with friends for a couple of weeks, but it got to the point that I couldn't overstay my welcome, so I moved to a homeless shelter. I, Derek, came up to the Twin Cities about 20 years ago to live with my sister. I'm from Chicago, but it made sense to try another place once my fi family started moving. For a few years, I, I stayed with family and friends, mostly couch hopping, but I had the resources to get my own place and I started renting an apartment for a while, but once the landlord raised the rent, I couldn't afford it. After I moved out of my apartment, I kept bouncing from place to place. I spent some time at a homeless shelter in Minneapolis and that's where I met Sheila. People told me she was quiet and that she didn't want to talk to anybody, but for some reason, we just clicked. Within just a few minutes, we exchanged phone numbers and we've been together ever since. We spent some time trying to find the right place for us to stay for the long term. We knew more than anything that we didn't want to be apart. In a world that was hectic and complicated and loud, being together helped make everything feel calmer. Being together made the rest of the world bearable. The workers in the shelter helped us each get permanent supportive housing with Aon. It took a couple of years, but eventually we got placed in a building in downtown Minneapolis where we could each have our own apartment and still be together. At the same time, the workers at the shelter helped us get vouchers to help cover the rent on our apartments. Having a stable place to stay where we can be together and where we don't have to worry about the rent has changed everything. Today, we have three cats together who we call our babies. We help plan community events in our building, coffee hours, craft and game nights, movie nights and other things like that. We love where we live and our housing vouchers made it possible. The subsidies that Bring It Home Minnesota would provide would help others like us find and maintain safe housing. We ask you to support and pass House File 11 this year. Thank you. Sincerely, Sheila Stafford and Derek Karacha. Thank you so much for sharing that testimony with us, Paul, and thank you, Derek and Sheila, uh, so much for contributing your testimony to this conversation. So I was uh, moving us a little bit faster than I needed to, and I know we have a couple more questions in the chat, so I want to make sure those voices um, get heard. One of the questions that I see is, what are the chances of this bill getting passed? It's a very good question. Uh, there is a very good chance that this bill will be, well, there's almost a certainty that it'll be included in the House housing bill that, um, that, that we will be pushing through the Minnesota House. There'll be another bill in the Senate. The big question will be the dollar amount, um, just kind of how our legislative process works um, each, area of the budget will get a, how, a target that our leadership will kind of negotiate. And then Vice Chair Bajay and I and our committee will uh, try to work to make some decisions and, and try to assess needs across the housing continuum. Um, we are really committed to, to putting as much resource as we can into this program. Um, and then we do have to sort of negotiate with the Senate, with the governor's office to try to come to a resolution. Um, and so that isn't a guarantee. It's why a conversation like this is so helpful because the, the more that other legislators, the more that folks in the governor's office hear from people that this is important, that this is the year we gotta make this happen, that helps improve those chances. And so um, I feel good, but I also feel like we have still a lot of work left to do uh, before we get across the finish line. So I, I don't know, that's a bit of a politician answer. I didn't give an exact uh, percentage or anything, but, but I feel good and we've still got work to do. Absolutely. It's a fight and we already named that we won't hit the, the full 2 billion this year, but likely 
the bill will see something. So that's um, a great place to start. One of the other questions I see in the chat here, what are the chances, I'm sorry, did you mention that this um, bill can be transferred generationally, that the voucher can be transferred generationally? There isn't anything in the bill that would specifically allow for that. It's an interesting conversation. I'd be willing to kind of think about what that might sort of look like. I do think from a functional standpoint, um, something like this would allow for a better transfer of generational wealth um, because we'd be, I mean, as we know that there are, are huge racial inequities in terms of who's a renter now versus a homeowner, if we're able to help create more resource for renters, that creates more paths potential into home ownership as uh, Esther was talking about. And so nothing specifically, but I think it's again, one of those sort of indirect benefits if we're able to move forward with something like this. Awesome. Um, I'm getting a question from the, the party that the residents are having at the Urban Homeworks office. Uh, can residents use, can current residents use these vouchers and stay in Urban Homeworks? I want to say yes. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can absolutely stay. Hey, y'all. Thanks for joining us. I don't know if you guys can see the, the crew yeah. hanging out there. Um, so I am not actually seeing any other questions. So I want to just open it up. I know we have a lot of folks um, that are visiting us today. And so if there's any last questions um, that you have, uh, we can take those if you just pop them into the chat. I see a, a question from Claudia. Is there a possibility that these vouchers wind up adding to rent increases as landlords may believe they now have access to additional sources of funding? That is a great question, Claudia. And I will turn it over to Representative Akbaje to kick us off. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's always kind of the trouble with these things, right? With inflation and with landlords trying to increase as much profit as possible. There's we don't have any type of like rent stabilization or rent control. So there's no reason why a landlord could at any time decide to raise their rent. I mean, we would hope not because hopefully landlords, especially those who are trying to do this as a small side business, can see this as um, sustained income. So hopefully they wouldn't raise the rents. But I think that's just a question, especially for some of these like larger companies um, that are really in housing commodification and for profit. So I think we'll just have to see. And then we'll, you know, we're all we're always thinking about ways to kind of increase housing affordability. And so this is always part of the conversation to make sure that people aren't just trying to squeeze as much profit out of housing as they can. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Representative Howard, did you have anything you wanted to add? I'll just say it's another, it's a really good question. And another reason why we absolutely need to be focused on building more housing as well. Um, and in terms of just the basic su supply, supply demand issue that it, if we can't create more supply, there are going to be incentives and pressures to continue to raise the rent. And so that's, that's what that question brings to mind too. Absolutely. And I will just share that there is a fight in Minneapolis for a rent stabilization policy. Um, if you're curious to learn more about that, we have done a, a panel discussion on that framework um, here at Urban Homeworks. And so you can learn about that as well. Um, let's see, I'm seeing one more question here in the chat. When families move, where the, will their children still be able to stay in their current schools? So I think that's a question speaking to like the transfer of the voucher, if you have mm. I think I just actually heard about this from some constituents. I think it depends on the school district. So my understanding is that Minneapolis schools, if you, they have a program to keep students who are facing homelessness housed. So if, if the family for some reason needs to move outside of the district, they can still keep going to a Minneapolis school for about a year is what I was told. So statewide, I don't know how that works because I imagine every school district probably has different rules. Yeah, that's a fair point. Well, as we we do wrap this segment now, um, I think I'm. I think my team will be happy that I'm back on track with our timing, and I do apologize uh, for that uh, oversight on my part. I just want to thank you all so much 
for doing this fishbowl with us. It's very vulnerable. It's like a very, you know, we're all kind of in your face here watching you. Um, but residents, thank you so much for your time. We know you all are balancing a lot of things in your lives and it's just so, it's such an honor to us that you're willing to share your stories to help move this forward. Representatives, we also know that you are incredibly busy during this time as well. So thank you for taking a minute um, out of the day to help educate folks um, on the potential for passing, bring it home. And with that, Tammy is probably so excited for her ED to stop messing up. <laughs> no, no, this is great. This is great. Forum. Thank you, Tammy. I'm gonna get over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your time. I hope this was so encouraging and exciting for you all. I am hyped right now. It was so great just to see the electeds meet the our residents where we're at and have honest conversation. Um, residents, you brought really great questions and had me thinking. It was so great. And I'm really excited to see how um, our elected officials take this um, back to their colleagues and get back to work on this bill. Um, I'm actually in full agreement with both Representative Agbaje and uh, Rep. Howard on the importance of calling your legislators and doing the work. And that's why we're actually going to do that. So sorry in advance to you, Chair Howard and Representative Ogbaje, because you might be getting a lot of voicemails right now because we want all of you on this call um, to unmute your screen and well, keep your phone uh, volume muted, but show your screen, pick up your phone and use this QR code to find your legislator, um, both your representative and your senator. And we want you to take the time to call them and tell them how you feel about this bill. If you want them to support it, tell them to support this bill. Um, again, it takes all of us and we're trusting the elected officials to hear our voice, understanding that they work for us and they serve us. So tell them what you want to hear. So we're going to take some time today, right now, to talk to our elected officials. So please use this QR code. I got my phone. I'm ready to do it. I'm going to call my elected officials and tell them what I think. And I hope you're doing the same thing. Um, so if you need help with a, um, like what to say, here's a template. It will also be in the chat for you to email your representatives as well. So we want to take a moment to both call and email our elected officials, the governor too, let's flood his inbox and his voicemail as well. So we're gonna take 10 minutes to do that. Emily, feel free to play that music and y'all let's get to work.
Can y'all bring that back up again, please? Thank you. Thank you. 
thank you so much i i don't know if you can see in the polls but almost 20 people either have or committing in the next 24 hours to contact their legislator and that is phenomenal we are so excited not only to educate each other on the importance of this bill but do the work to move it forward so again i want to thank you all for your time for showing up today thank you again for all the speakers both elected officials and residents um thank you for your time and lastly if you enjoyed or learned something from the event today or if our work in community organizing building homes and stabilizing communities aligned with your values I encourage, I encourage you all to give and support to Urban Homeworks today. Thank you so much for your time. You all have a great rest of your evening.